I think that what we saw at, in that conference was a moment when far-right ideas about women, migration, about economics, were suddenly allowed to have a mainstream platform. And what was really interesting is in 2019, when a Conservative MP spoke at that conference, it was seen as a big deal. It was like he was, people were calling for him to be rebuked. There were calls for him to apologise. Three, four years on, suddenly the Home Secretary is there. Mm -hmm. Michael Gove is there. People who we would consider to be very mainstream Conservative MPs, no matter what you think of their policies, mm. they're in charge of the country. And so I think it was a really dangerous moment where things that used to be extreme and things that we used to not be able to say quite rightly are suddenly allowed and suddenly accepted and normalised. And that's bad for everyone. That's bad for migrant people, it's bad for women, it's bad for LGBT people, it's bad for anyone who is a sort of marginalised community. And we need to take it really seriously. Hello, Sean. Hi, thank you for having me. No, thank you for coming on publication day of yes. all days. Yeah, it's really exciting. It's so exciting. And come up from Bristol, everything. So yeah. The honour of all of it. Um, so we're going to be talking about something a bit heavier than we yeah. normally do on Politics Joe. Uh, we're going to be talking about your book that's called Bodies Under Siege. And let's just go right in. Let's just start with Roe v. Wade. Yes. Which is where you start in the book. Yeah, so it's nearly a year now since Roe was overruled by the Dobbs judgment in the Supreme Court. And since then, we've just seen catastrophe, really, for women's rights across the US. You know, millions of women lost their right to bodily autonomy basically overnight. That first weekend after the judgment, state after state after state implemented abortion bans. And we're now seeing the consequences of that. We're seeing women suing the states. Like, I think there are 13 women in Texas who are suing because they were put in life-threatening situations after being denied reproductive health care. This is the reality of abortion bans. It's women in hospital beds. It's women being forced to carry pregnancies to term that they don't want. It's women really suffering. And I think, you know, it's been a very difficult year and it's a very strange time to be releasing this book in mm. the wake of that decision but also hopefully gives it a new kind of urgency about why we need to be talking about abortion and why we need to be constantly on the alert and constantly defending our rights. Mm. I mean, there's, there's so much in here and we'll get into all of the conspiracies and yeah. you know, everything that's underneath sort of the top line. But I mean, for we, we've got a predominantly male audience, yeah. to be honest. Um, let's talk about what you mean by it can be life-threatening for a woman because it's not necessarily just about... I, quote unquote choice mm. it's also about you know what can physically happen to a woman if they're forced to carry a, a child to term I don't know if you could talk a bit about that yeah so I think there's two really important aspects to pull out of that and again we're talking about dark things and I'm, I'm going to get quite dark quite mm. quickly because just last week we had news from Poland that another woman has died after being refused reproductive health care her name was Dorota she was 33 years old she was 20 weeks pregnant with her first child what happened in that situation is she had an emergency within her pregnancy, her amniotic sac burst. And what happens in Poland, because they have very, very strict abortion laws there, is that doctors have what they call the waiting position. And that means they wait and wait and wait to see if the pregnancy can be saved. And only then, when it's really clear that it can't be saved, do they act. By that point, it's often too late. So Dorota is the fourth woman in Poland to have died since January 2021. So I think when we're looking at situations such as the overruling of Roe, it's not only the sort of very visceral thing of knowing that your rights have been taken away. It's the fact that when you are pregnant, you are very scared that should something go wrong, you're not going to get the health care that you need. At the same time, we know that in a lot of the states that have banned abortion, the sort of maternal death rates are very, very high or disproportionately high compared to the UK, compared to Western Europe or compared to some of the sort of the blue states, as they call them. So I think we have to understand that this whole kind of issue about abortion bans is a sort of psychological and emotional thing. It's that idea that you are seen as a reproductive vessel, that you don't have control over your bodily autonomy and that you don't have full human rights over your body. But it's also a very real medical situation where if something goes wrong in your pregnancy, if you have a miscarriage, if something horrific happens, like in the case of Dorita, you could, your life is at risk and you no longer can be guaranteed that you'll get the health care that you would have got in the States a year ago. And still on that kind of like quite visceral health care you know, mm. branch of all of this, you know, women don't stop having abortions. People don't stop, you know. I mean, what, what are the effects of, you know, banning it lawfully? So we know that 
thousands of women die as a result of unsafe abortion every year. Because, as you say, abortion bans don't stop abortion. Um, abortion. They stop safe abortion. Mm. So when I was in Kenya during the time that I was writing the book, I went and interviewed um, some activists in a rural city in Kenya. And one of the women told me that she knew students when she was at university who would drink disinfectant to try and end a pregnancy. Now, you don't, you don't have me to explain why that's not a safe thing to do. But this is what women will do. Women are desperate. Mm. They, you know, if you can't have a baby, if you don't want to have a baby, if you feel that your sort of control has been taken away from you as a result of these abortion bans, you're going to try and find ways of ending that pregnancy. I was speaking to activists in Kenya last week who were talking about, you know, things that we associate with, you know, early 20th century Victorian stuff, you know, putting objects inside you to try and end the pregnancy. That can cause infection, that can cause tears. Yeah. It can mean that when you are pregnant, when you want to get pregnant later on in life, you can't because your reproductive system has been damaged. And so, you know, abortion bans are not only harmful because they're an attack on women's rights, they're harmful because they deny women reproductive justice and they deny you control over your body. And ultimately, they can lead to women dying. And I think one of the times when I sort of started looking at abortion rights as a feminist and as a journalist and this stat that has never left me is the rate of women or teenage girls in El Salvador who make up a significant proportion of maternal deaths because they take their own lives when they get pregnant and they don't want to be. That's the impact and I think it can sometimes be very easy to think about this in a sort of oh it's a debate or it's a the theoretical issue but actually it's a really embodied issue and when you take away women's control over their own bodies, you take away everything. You take away their freedom and you take away their right to health care. I think it's interesting that you kind of like, you almost were looking at me to check to see if it was okay that you said something so yeah. epic. And yeah. I think that's what's so interesting about this whole conversation is I suppose it's, it's almost uncouth to mm. sort of link the pretty pink woman mm. with you know something quite medical and quite you know quite ugly mm. and I guess that's why we all go a bit like tense and I suppose that men have this weird kind of you know let's not talk about it and they should yeah. you know but I mean how much of that how important is that like the sort of like the perfect woman who delivers child how important is that to this whole debate I think it's there's so much going on around the way that we figure women's bodies in society the way that we kind of fetishize the maternal the way we think about motherhood that is very divorced from the realities of women's bodies and motherhood itself there's um when i first started looking at this issue i interviewed an activist in slovakia who talked about this idea that women have to suffer and women have to suffer to be a good woman mm. and that we're supposed to sacrifice ourselves for the sake of our children and we sacrifice our health if, if necessary to be the good mother and to reproduce now obviously mothers do sacrifice a huge amount being a mother is really hard it's like and it's an amazing thing that mothers do for their children but this belief that women somehow need to suffer is really really potent at the same time we have this sort of fetish i can never say it fetishization yeah, <laughs> too Fetish many essays yeah. of motherhood that kind of you know, particularly on the far right, and I talk a lot about far right ideas about women in the book, that is not sort of reflective of the reality of what women need. So we don't think about healthcare, we don't think about housing, we don't think about how women can feed their children. We just sort of be like, women should be mothers, and that's their role, and we're not going to do anything to support them. And so I think that's a real big problem in the way that we consistently fail to deliver you know, rights to women and choice to women and justice to women. There's, let's get into some of those. Yeah. <laughs> that those, yeah. I mean, so you talk a lot about patterns of misogyny mm. and white supremacy and how this argument is all entangled with it. So maybe should we start kind of like at the National Conservative Conference that's just yes. gone? I mean, how on earth is that linked to abortion? So... I found the National Conservatism Conference absolutely fascinating and unfortunately I wasn't able to go because I was on a training course but I sort of watched from the wings as it were and to me it really represented a quite terrifying moment of when a lot of the extremist ideas that I talk about in the book are suddenly mainstream conservative conversation. So the sort of standout moment for me was when the Conservative MP Miriam Cates said that the one thing liberal individualism has failed to deliver are babies. And 
I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> I don't think she realised the kind of necessarily this far right conspiracy that is linked to this idea about women's individualism and the need to have children. But there's so much going on there about women's role to, is to reproduce and that we're failing as women if we do not produce babies for the nation. I think that what we saw at, in that conference was a moment when far right ideas about women, migration, about economics, were suddenly allowed to have a mainstream platform. And what was really interesting is in 2019, when a conservative MP spoke at that conference, it was seen as a big deal. It was like he was, people were calling for him to be rebuked. There were calls for him to apologize. Three, four years on, suddenly the Home Secretary's there, mm -hmm. Michael Gove is there, people who we would consider to be very mainstream conservative MPs, no matter what you think of their policies, mm. they're in charge of the country. And I was thinking about this a lot afterwards, and I was like, okay, like I say, I know a lot about far-right conspiracy, I see a lot of this language being used in very hostile, very extremist spaces. It's not necessarily the case that the MPs speaking are in the same spaces that I'm looking at. But there's one thing that they cannot excuse anymore, and that was the use of the term cultural Marxism. People were using that term in the conference very loosely, very easily. There's no one, you can't convince me that anyone in sort of the mainstream right now doesn't know that that is a sort of far right dog whistle. And so I think it was a really dangerous moment where things that used to be extreme and things that we used to not be able to say quite rightly are suddenly allowed and suddenly accepted and normalized. And that's bad for everyone. That's bad for migrant people, it's bad for women, it's bad for LGBT people, it's bad for anyone who is a sort of marginalised community. And we need to take it really seriously. And why is that? Because there's sort of like a proposed natural order? Or like what, I mean, what is it that they're, they're striving to achieve or to, you know, put back into place? So I think when we look at the way abortion rights and women's rights are positioned on the far right, there is this thing called the natural order. And it's a sort of idea that human beings are governed by nature, that there's no rationalism, there's no sort of society. We're all just animals basically doing things that, we're, you know, that come naturally. And that progress progressive politics, abortion rights, LGBT rights, rights for migrant people are a sort of usurp usurpation of this natural order. And in a natural order, men are superior, women are inferior, black and global majority people are inferior, and LGBT people just don't exist. They just don't figure in a natural order at all. And the way that the far right wants to achieve the natural order is through this kind of alpha male patriarchal authority figure and also pinning women to reproduction. And when you take this into the kind of far right conspiracy space, what this means is that white women need to reproduce for the white nation and that we're going to, you know, either violently repatriate migrant people or, you know, on the most extreme corners of this, you know, promoting genocide. And women are like, their role is to be the wife, the mother, and to keep having babies. Feminism, abortion rights, civil rights, LGBT rights are all seen as the enemy of this kind of movement. And that's a really dangerous thing. And the kind of common way that this is known on the far right is the great replacement conspiracy theory. This idea that migrant people from the global south are replacing white people in the global north and they're being aided by feminism and aided by abortion rights. Now, again, I'm not saying that people necessarily at the conference were aware of this conspiracy theory, mm. but the language that they are using is very reflective of the language in the conspiracy theory. And I think what we really need to worry about is that when these ideas take hold, when these ideas move from the kind of extremist far right into the mainstream right, we start to see policies that regress women's rights. The most obvious example being Roe v. Wade. So when you look at some of the kind of more, you know, maybe extreme Republican figures who are anti-abortion, they will talk quite openly about replacement. There was a guy called Steve King, who was a congressman, who talked about, you know, the American people being replaced and abortion being part of that. Closer to home, we see people like Viktor Orban, who again, talks very easily about replacement and has put policies in place that are designed to incentivize ethnic Hungarian women to have more babies. I always think in the UK, we've got quite secure abortion rights. The law is a bit dodgy. It's not a very clear law, but there's not a huge amount of desire or popular support for rolling back abortion rights. 
but we can see more and more the kind of eroding of women's economic security over the last 13 years, the way that austerity has disproportionately impacted women, the way that women are kind of giving up work because they can't afford childcare. There are various policies that sort of take away women's public space and put women back into the domestic space. Mm. And I think we just need to be alert to it. We need to be alert to the rhetoric. We need to be alert to the language and recognize that, as I say, things that were extreme are now becoming more mainstream. There's a danger that it can all sound, what you're saying can sound hyperbolic because yes. it just <laughs> seems so, I guess it just seems so wild, doesn't it? That that sort of thing could happen or could infiltrate our systems. But, but it has because you talk about Turning Point. Now, Turning Point's always been a massive fascination for yeah, me. Yeah. It's sort of this youth group, this youth conservative group who have very right wing, you know, small c conservative values. Um, that's, that's actually probably the most polite way <laughs> of framing them. But, you know, a few years ago when they came about during the Brexit debate and during the Trump era, they were kind of seen as pariahs and quite mm. outside. But now they're quite embedded into the party and they've actually got quite a, a strong voice and they're being heard. And then there's also Tufton Street. Mm. So you've really got these voices are being translated into government policy. Is that right? I think so. And I think, again, we have to look at like different national contexts. So in the US, abortion was the big issue. Mm. You know, there was as soon as Roe was passed, if not even before, when it was looking likely it was going to pass, you know, the anti-abortion movement, the right of the Republican Party, the far right activists in the US were constantly on it and campaigning. And abortion was somewhere where they thought they could win. Now, as I say, in the UK, we don't have the same context for abortion. There's, you know, Groups who are anti-abortion, they can be very noisy, they can be quite aggressive, they can put up their big posters and cause a huge stir, but they're not getting anywhere politically necessarily. Mm. Where we've seen the shift in the UK is much more on migrant rights and much more on the kind of LGBT sphere, the sort of anti-trans, anti-drag queens narratives. And these are areas where I think, you know, those kind of influential voices on the right have actually sort of been like, right, okay, well, we can... We can push an anti-migrant narrative. We can push an anti-LGBT narrative. And the government has kind of followed those narratives and started putting policies in place. You know, we're talking while the illegal migration bill is being debated in the House of Commons and the House of Lords. I mean, such a vicious bill, you know, proposing things that a few years ago were overturned because they were seen as anti-human rights and as dangerous and as cruel. Now these things are back in fashion. Similarly, I think in some parts of Europe, again, abortion is much more the context, much more the big issue where the right feels they can win. And in other parts of Europe, it's LGBT rights, particularly in Hungary at the moment. Mm. There's been a huge pushback against LGBT rights. And so I think what's interesting to note and important to follow is where are these pressure points? What messages are the far right putting out there that we're then seeing adopted by government? And as I say here, I think it's definitely migration and definitely LGBT issues. But then that opens the door for the other issues. Mm. And again, I've always been very clear that I don't think we're going to see abortion bans in the UK. I just think it's an unlikely thing. But I can see more and more, and particularly I wrote this after the conference itself, being like, we're going to maybe start seeing this issue become more contested and more discussed. But we absolutely need to be fighting on the kind of migrant rights and LGBT rights in the UK at the moment. So what we're hearing that through is sort of, as you as you put in the book, it's it's the war on woke, that yeah. kind of strap line that we heard from every single candidate that ran to be the leader of the Conservative Party a few months ago. It's that kind of creeping in. Is that what you mean? Yes, absolutely. Mm. I think those are the, the pressure points that we're seeing in the UK where, again, far right ideas, far right rhetoric... And far-right conspiracy theories, let's face it, are kind of getting some cut through and then being picked up by government who think, OK, well, I can make myself a bit more popular with this or this is going to win me some votes. Not necessarily sure it's going to succeed, but it's interesting how we've seen that migration of ideas. I think, it, I think it really is working. I mean, you look at the kind of the volume of mm. anti-trans um, mm articles that are run in like you know all of the broadsheets it, it, it's astonishing mm -hmm. and you know most days you can't turn on any news channel without being bombarded with some kind of I mean what was going on at Honor Oak which is near Lewisham and it was this it was just a little quiet drag show 
Yeah. And suddenly it was like this national crisis and yeah. suddenly the whole country is sort of steeped in depravity and it's just like, you know, that's that's what you're talking about then, isn't it? This kind of like, so that's our pressure point. Yes, and I think it's interesting as well. I wrote a long read um, for the Lead UK about the Honor Oak protests. Mm. And again, I sort of started from the American context because we saw these kind of anti-drag queen story hour protests in America. And then that kind of migrated onto far-right telegram channels in the UK. And they were using that sort of similar hateful rhetoric that we kind of are now quite familiar with, the sort of grooming and all of this, you know, moral panic about drag queen yeah. singing Incy Wincy Spider in a library. Um, and I think what was really interesting about that is how the far right is incredibly internationally networked at the moment. We don't necessarily have the old kind of structures that we had perhaps in the 80s, even the 90s, of specific groups with leaders and, you know, they'd go out onto the streets and have a ruckus and, you know, there was a kind of siloed organisations because of the internet, because of Telegram, because of the way that we all kind of communicate these days, the far right can put messages out there and they will be picked up across the infosphere and then propagated and then taken out into the public. And that's a, you know, again, that kind of scary thing. If we go back to abortion rights, ideas about abortion that are very familiar in the US are now much more common on the kind of UK far right Telegram channels and in far right, right. groups because you don't need to have the single leader who takes your group out onto the streets. You don't need to have a kind of meeting in the back room of a pub where you all sort of talk your hateful stuff. It's just out there on the internet and people pick up on it and it goes through, you know, your YouTube show. It goes into your Telegram channel. And so these kind of narratives and these shared conspiracy theories and these shared ideologies are able to, to spread much more easily. And I think it's interesting, this kind of transnational, it's not transnational organising necessarily, it's transnational narratives. Mm. And none of these spaces are particularly taken to women or... No, <laughs> like, no, absolutely not. Although it's interesting because even in the UK far right, you have these quite prominent women who sort of hold this dual role where they, you know, they have to be the kind of submissive you know they want to they're a, they play the sort of part of the, the stereotypical far-right women or the idealized women but they also have these leadership roles and they're in this kind of weird bind where they're like oh but I don't really want to be on this platform I don't I want yeah. to you know go home and be with, have babies and get married and but also if I'm not here I'm not able to recruit other women and I'm just doing this because we're trying to win and this is how we win. Well, I guess, I mean, it's not quite as extreme, but then I suppose it is. Every, Miriam Cates, when you talk about that Tory MP who's standing up at this national conference, and conservatives, sorry, conservatism conference, I'm doing what you did with yeah. <laughs> fetishization. When she's standing and she's talking about all of these ideas about a mother should be in the home, we should be providing babies. And it's like, but you're on the stage, you mm. know, doing the job that you're essentially saying is that of a man. You know, mm. it's, yeah, all very convoluted. And I think as well, it's like there's nothing wrong with being a stay at home mum. There's nothing wrong with wanting to have children. Like no. most women have children of and course. it's really valuable. And we're all, you know, happy when it happens to us. If we yeah. want to have a baby or a friend or a, a relative, we, you know, we should celebrate the, the joy of having children. But none of the people who are proposing that that's women's role seem to be that interested in solving the housing crisis or rolling back the austerity measures that have made it harder for women to have children. It's very much this kind of like, you should do this, but don't expect any help from us. Well, let's talk about childcare then, because mm. so you want us to, you know, Miriam Cates wants us to go and have babies, populate the earth, but we also need to go to work mm. and you have made it pretty much impossible to provide childcare for a lot of women in the UK. I mean, how, how much of an effect does lack of childcare have on, I guess, feminism? It's really fundamental. And I think um, there was a report that came out last week that Maya Oppenheim wrote for The Independent about how abortion rates are going up in, the, in Scotland, I think it was. And one of the reasons was lack of childcare. Like women were like, I can't afford to have a wanted baby because I can't afford childcare and I don't have child tax credits for my third child anymore. And so the, mm. you know, sensible thing to do is not to have another child. 
this is heartbreaking. Like, and this is one of the things I really want to push in the book, is this idea of reproductive justice. Abortion rights is not simply about having the right not to have a child. It's about having, the ju having reproductive justice so that every woman or every family can make the decision to have the family that they want to have, be that to have 10 children or 15 yeah. children or no children at all, and to have the social support and the network and the, the safety net to be able to make those choices for, for themselves. And this is something that goes back into this kind of, you know, 1960s, you know, women's liberation movement when abortion wasn't legal. This idea that it's not just about saying, I can choose not to have a baby. It's about saying, I can choose to have a baby because I know that I'm going to get the support that I need to have that child. Mm. And that's something I think we really need to hold on to as, as a feminist movement, as a women's liberation movement, as a pro-abortion movement. Because otherwise, we're not achieving change for women. We're just kind of keeping everything sort of at the status quo and it's a bit rubbish. Mm. I mean, how do we tackle that now? So, we, you know, we talk about, well, you say it's not quite here yet, that that's sort of like American and parts of Europe, that kind of language isn't here yet on the mainstream. I would argue it's, it feels it's there. I mean, like mm -hmm. just last year um, in Parliament, there was a, a debate on abortion and quite a few MPs stood up to say their piece about how they didn't believe in it. And it almost feels like that regression mm. is starting. So what now? Yeah, I think the really important thing to hold on to in, in the UK is that we have had really big wins on abortion mm. in the past few years. Biggest win, obviously, 2019, decriminalisation of abortion in Northern Ireland. So now abortion is available on demand in Northern Ireland which makes it unique in the UK. It's not available on demand in the rest of the UK. We also had the win on telemedicine so that women can now take abortion pills in their own home as opposed to having to take the abortion pills in a medical premises, mm. such as a doctor's office or an abortion clinic. These were really important changes and they do show that there's a very strong kind of pro-abortion lobby in the UK like, and that there's MPs who are really willing to stick their necks out and demand better for women's rights. Of course, when these kind of changes happen, that's what brings out the antis. <laughs> you know, that's what gives them a platform to talk about their sort of view and to try and push their agenda. One of the interesting things about the telemedicine change was that the government put that out to consultation. And I think nearly half of the responses that they got was from the anti-abortion movement. This is partly because a lot of people who are like, yeah, I don't really have a view on abortion, but I think it's fine. I'm not going to respond to a government consultation. Yeah. I responded because I, you know, I'm really engaged in these issues. And of course, the antis respond because it's like, yes, this is our time. We can win. So I think it's important to hold on to those wins. But also, as you say, it creates a space for the anti-abortion movement to suddenly make a lot of noise. And my real concern, as I said before, is because we're seeing more and more extreme narratives about other social justice issues, such as migration and LGBT rights, that's when we can potentially start to see an, the door opening for more extreme rhetoric about women, and then that leads to more extreme policies about women. We know that when it was the leadership contest, for example, for the Tories in last summer, gosh, seems so long ago, mm. and it's not that long ago no. at all, is it? Um, so much crap you know, some followed. Of the, the MPs had either abstained from abortion votes or voted against progressive change on abortion. Mm. We know that there are very prominent conservative MPs who have big media platforms who are vocally anti-abortion. And so we just have to be aware. And I think this is one of the lessons from Roe. It's not necessarily, you know, America is different. It has a very different culture. There's a lot more kind of issues around Christian nationalism. There's a much more religious kind of influence in politics and you know they have the supreme court system which is obviously very different to our political system but i think a lot of people were shocked by the dobbs decision because it's like oh well we've got abortion rights that's fixed that's never going to change we can't ever rest on our laurels we have to be really proactive about defending women's rights we have to be really proactive about defending bodily autonomy and recognize that you know if you really believe that women are human and that women have human rights you have to constantly fight for it and you have to be talking about it and defending it you can't just expect things to always be okay because sometimes they're not do you think that Andrew Tate comes into any of this so I think the really 
concerning thing about the Andrew Tate phenomenon, as much as I dislike giving him the uh, credit that that word would suggest, is the sort of shifting attitudes of young men towards women's rights. Now, I think I'm very like hopeful about the younger generation. I think that we've got a really politically engaged youth. And we see this with climate activism, we see this with migrant rights, we see this with like the incredible energy and vitality of the LGBT rights movement. At the same time, and I talk about this a lot in the book because I spent way too long on incel forums <laughs> and red pill forums. And Was looking that healthy at, for you? You have to have very good, like strict rules about how long you spend in those spaces mm -hmm. and what you do afterwards. <laughs> um, like, but I think, you know, there is this force of toxic masculinity that is represented by people like Tate, which is sort of telling young men that they're not getting their, their desserts. They're not getting the things that they're entitled to and the thing that they're entitled to is a women's body. And we need to, you know, there was a poll that was done by YouGov, I think recently, that was looking at men's attitudes towards women, looking at issues around consent, looking at issues about women's roles in relationships and in society. And a minority, but still a significant minority of young men had really regressive views about mm. this. And um, I think, again, we kind of, we can always sort of fall into that trap of thinking that progress is in, goes in one way. And that if we, our generation grew up with kind of feminist role models and young men sort of learning about being positive about women, it doesn't mean that that's always going to continue. And so we absolutely have to fight back against these sort of toxic masculine figures who try and tell men that they're entitled to women, that women who don't want to have sex with them are somehow abusing them. <laughs> And, and that, you know, women have a choice. And I was actually talking to an activist last week who was saying that they'd run workshops for young men to try and challenge gender stereotypes, kind of say like women have a right to demand contraception, women have a right to say no to sex and to say yes to sex. <laughs> you know, like these are, these are things that might seem quite basic, but we need to be pushing that message all the time because otherwise we're letting the men like Andrew Tate control the narrative. And it's interesting as well because a lot of the incels don't like Andrew Tate. I think there's sometimes a desire to kind of lump all men's rights activists yeah. together. And actually, it's uh, they're all infighting just as much as everyone else. As the conversation around him is so complicated, isn't it? And it's yeah. sort of like when it gets a five minute segment, as I've just sort of done yeah. there, you, you don't have time to get into like all of the intricacies of it. Sorry, that reminded me of something that you wrote in the book, and I'll read it to you if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. So you said if the, peer, if the people experiencing disadvantage happen to be white men, the causes are no longer individual but externalised and the external forces causing the crisis in white maleness are anti-racist, anti-sexist movements, rhetoric and policies. What, what did you mean by that? So I was specifically in that moment talking about a couple of things that had happened in the UK um, over the past couple of years. There was a sort of move in in sort of right-wing politics to argue that we take the sort of anti-racist, anti-sexist movements were not helpful, that protected characteristics were not helpful, and that actually we should be focusing on individual empowerment and stop talking about kind of class-based or systemic oppression, and that women, you know, can just pull yourself up by your bootstraps and be equal to everyone else, and, and that there's, there's no such thing as systemic racism, there's no such thing as systemic sexism. And at the same time, we had this narrative that, you know, and it's true, like we know that there's a problem with sort of educational attainment in white working class communities. Mm -hmm. We know that white working class boys particularly are struggling with educational attainment and that has a long term impact on employment and all sorts of issues. And we need to be talking about issues around men's mental health. All of these things are vitally important. But when the kind of right wing narrative about these things focused on men, it was suddenly like, oh, there's this, it's, it's not the individual that's the problem. The individual can't just pull themselves up by their bootstraps. It's all these systemic issues that are, cr are preventing them from achieving their full potential. And of course, that is actually true when we think about systemic issues around ingrained poverty and intergenerational poverty and the deindustrialization of, of various communities. But what the right wing were talking about was 
oh, it's women's fault, it's black people's fault. It's the fact that we're talking about white privilege in classrooms. That's the problem. That's what's harming men's educational or boys' educational Drag attainment. Shows. Drag shows. If we didn't have these kind of, you know, movements for social justice, then men would be just fine. And it just really struck me that the only people who, you know, in this individualist narrative that are suddenly being oppressed by systems were men. And yet when we talk about, we know that systemic sexism and systemic racism exists. We know that that's what is leading to, you know, race, you know, racism in the criminal justice system and lack of kind of educational attainment for black boys. We, we know that these are kind of systemic issues, but the narrative was that, oh, that's an individual problem or it's a problem with, you know, single mums or it's a problem with families. It's, it's not anything to do with the system. And yet we were told that white men are being oppressed by feminism. Do you personally feel there's pushback on your journalism? On my gen Yeah. Like sort of a backlash? Yeah. I think we're talking about things that like me and my friends talk about so casually and so, you know, almost throw away. And then the comparison would be what you hear on broadcasts and what you read in broadsheets. And I can imagine that you're work would face quite a lot of criticism um yeah I guess I mean I think being a woman journalist online is is always you're going to get pushback and backlash mm. I think I've um I mean last week I wrote a piece about trad wives and that was that was a fun experience <laughs> getting what did you lots say about of trad wives oh just that you know the sort of issues about it being linked to kind of far-right conspiracy and that idea about women's naturalized role being to reproduce and and how that links to fascistic notions of womanhood. And yeah, I got some interesting emails, shall we say. Gosh. One that just had the subject line, man. <laughs> like, what did he have to say? He just, that I needed a man. Oh. Yeah, like, the classic. Did he, did he offer himself? No, he's got a very <laughs> joyful wife. Oh, really? Okay, He's good. very keen to let, let me know. <laughs> I'm happy for him. Yeah. Um, well, thank you really very much. I would definitely recommend buying the book because I haven't even touched or scratched the surface on what Sean has written here. And it is definitely worth your time. Thank so you. thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs>